Hello everyone, welcome back to the Karak with Mehreen show. I'm so excited about today's guest. She is a phenomenal woman. She has changed the media landscape for women by creating The Tempest, a storytelling platform by women for women. She is a Forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur, a two times TEDx speaker, and she's literally done everything from entrepreneurship to startups to media to writing. She is a powerhouse. Let me please welcome Mashal Wakar. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, such a lovely intro. <laughs> yeah, like um I remember watching one of your uh, other episodes with with another podcast and she was saying that she couldn't fit the intro into one and I was relating to what she said and so it's 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 so cool everything everything that you've done. Um but to start, uh, I always give an an intro on my end but i wanted to ask you to introduce yourself but by eliminating the career just yeah. by introducing you as mashal who are you i i love that a lot because i think for a long time i would just um my identity was my work and so having to unlearn that has been has been a journey um so what am i or who am i i think that's a more important question um third culture kid born and raised in saudi um originally pakistani have lived in the gulf for pretty much i'd say most of my life um and then a very american education in the sense that i think that's really what formed um my identity a lot of my mindset and who i am um and and i think from then i've i've had this sort of journey where i've really just been exploring who i am as a person right i enjoy a lot of things i love writing i love reading i'm a big like nerd i love geeking out um i love garbage television <laughs> <laughs> like what <laughs> uh, well, that's getting embarrassing um pretty much all the shows i i love <laughs> i love reality shows you know all of the real estate shows and i justify i think being like at least i'm learning about real estate right like that. <laughs> <laughs> the per square footage oh yeah i can ask questions <laughs> so um yeah i feel like i would probably be able to know more about the real estate in in la or just like the oc <laughs> i mean you are learning something that's for sure <laughs> i think so <laughs> and then um what else i I'm, i'm a big lord of the rings fan like i'm a oh. fanatic i think i i don't i can't count the number of times i've actually watched that movie Well, um, I've never watched it. What? It's, so it's like one of the best. <laughs> everyone like has that reaction. Like, yeah, I know. I have to watch it because, like, everyone talks about how, like, it's OG. Like, it's the it's the class. It's a cl- kind of a classic. But I have- I'm down to watch it with you. Me oh. and my siblings, my best friend. We every few weeks, genuinely, every few weeks, we'll like do a marathon. And we like watch Oh wow, it. this is like commitment. Oh yeah. Yeah, we're committed. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I would love to watch it with you. <laughs> no, it's a genuine offer. Like we we do, we do watch it every few. <laughs> oh wow, that's I mean, I'm up for it. I love movies, but I don't know why I've never got the I mean, I haven't even watched Harry Potter. The thing is that I haven't watched like fantasy. I haven't delved into the fantasy yeah. area, but yeah, it's left something I want. I think I just it was it was such a big part of my childhood. And then I think now it's always connecting back to it. And then the number of times you watch it, the more you appreciate Makes it. Makes so right? much so sense. So many layers. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> and I loved that introduction about yourself. And like, you you were the first person who talked about these little things that you love, like um, Lord of the Rings and reality shows. So I just <laughs> like that authenticity. Thank um, you. And, and coffee, of course. Yeah. Like, oh, that's, yeah. that's like, I think food and coffee are the other two loves of and, my life. And maybe Karak. Well, of course, it's <laughs> like, that's just what we grew up with. Right? Yeah, true, <laughs> true. Um, so talking about authenticity and being candid, I remember reading um, something that you read talking about how you are very candid and you just, you don't, you just like to say what it is in your mind. And so do you get into trouble f- for that? I was very curious to know. Oh, my first couple of years, I can't tell you. Um, I remember sitting on this panel Um, there's all these women from corporate and this and that. Um, and I'm like, well, actually in, in, in the media space and it's, you know, PR, whatever, if you want to call it, um, there aren't a lot of at least brown women at that time, you know, you're going to see a lot of white women, uh, or men actually primarily. But then I looked around and as I'm saying this, I realized the whole table is literally <laughs> is was mostly white women. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, and, uh, I just, I was just speaking from my experiences where I felt like I wouldn't see other women 
or Pakistani women especially in this industry. And it was hard. And so I think I would speak a lot about that. There were a lot of times where I've spoken about, you know, I think being woke was an identity. And (laughs) and not that there's anything wrong with being, I think people should actually be aware, but I think there's a lot more nuance sometimes um, where people actually forget how to empathize with people. And um, so I would get in trouble because I think a lot of times it was just like, this is what feels right. And then when you're in the media industry, you also learn how to sound right. Yeah. And, and, and that was a whole thing. But yeah, a lot of times I think I would, I wouldn't say get in trouble, but I would say like the conversations would make people uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. So in that moment when you talked about the white women, they probably, did they say anything? There was a gasp for, for very audibly. And there was like, pin drop silence <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and, I, and when you you know it's like a closed room setting and everyone's staring and at you just like, everything and yeah. Was, yeah and i was well yeah and i think when i was younger it didn't you know you sort of don't care like you care but not really you know because you're like no this is right and it needs to be said yeah um nice. and and over time i think i've learned to respond not react i'd say okay that's, yeah, that's a great way to put it yeah 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 so so, uh, so when you say respond not react does that mean that you don't you don't you're not as candid or you're just candid in specific moments like what what do you mean by that um i think i take more time to understand what mm-hmm. i'm feeling there's a lot of introspection that happens like it's just like an immediate gut reaction but why and i think that's it's it's easier said than done um but that's that's really a big part of that is i'm gonna go on this whole like i'm gonna try and like literally just step away anytime I want to write an a- anything that's angry uh, and it's not that I don't express my anger and I can't or I can't express my emotions but I literally just try to like step away because I know if I'm just like angrily writing <laughs> one I write passionately but two I'm gonna regret it I'm yeah I most likely will regret it and so I like step away and I think about how I feel after and usually Makes I journal sense. and I um yeah it's not as easy when you're online I think and you <laughs> see like the worst side of people a lot of times yeah um but yeah that's what i mean i just take time to just be a bit more thoughtful yeah. in terms of what i'm gonna say yeah that's definitely difficult as you said it's definitely harder said than done but that's also something i've kind of struggled with like if if there's something that triggers me or 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 it's something that i don't agree with or it's something like disrespectful i always just respond or react the way you said like immediately and i realized i'll majority of the times i don't get the right rea- re- reaction in, in response to what i said so this is something i've always wanted to learn from other people and because you are someone who i've seen is very candid and expressive i wanted to understand that better from you so many times i think it's also i think people are allowed to express what they want to express right i think we got to make spaces comfortable for people where it's okay if you mess up. And it, a lot of times I'm, I'm wrong. I may not always be right. And so that's something I always share at least in, in public spaces and in people who have at least been reading or what I've been writing or, or at least, you know, following me for a while, like they'll know that I'm always like, I'm learning and unlearning all the time. So if I'm wrong, that's totally okay. I don't have to be right all the time as long as I can learn. And I think people need like, we got to give people grace, right? Like it's okay to mess up a lot yeah. of times you're saying what you're saying. Cause it comes from your understanding and your life experiences and whatever. Um, but I'll still say, I think sometimes, especially when there's a lot going on and everyone has an opinion, I think that's when it's really hard. Yeah. Um, because having compassion for everybody like that, that's extremely difficult. Yeah. 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 It's, it's hard to navigate through like a multitude of different opinions versus if you're just talking to one person, it can be, um, it can be a mutual dialogue, but then if yeah. there's multiple different people, it's hard to really balance everyone out. Yeah, and I think the other part is not everyone wants to listen. Oh right? yeah, like oh yeah, sometimes that's true. Just, they just want a reaction, or they just want to fight. They just want to be right. Yeah, I think yeah. That's, that's that's the other part where it's just like I understanding that helps, right? Because you're like, no matter what I say, you're just gonna have it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So how did this this uh, feeling of being authentic? Uh, come about like how did this emerge was this in in your childhood did your family sort of encourage you to speak up more how do you think um you were shaped into being so expressive and candid oh that's a good question um I don't I don't know if I've ever thought about that I I know I always felt a lot 
like I just had a lot of feelings. Emotions, yeah. Yeah, and and emotions and I would write a lot. Like I I I've, I read some of my older high school journals and I oh gosh, I was <laughs> such a you know, you'd really think I was carrying the weight of the world. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's Cause, like cause, every high school student. Yeah. They think like the world revolves around. Yeah, and that life is so unfair, unfair and this is like yeah. the most. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> um, so I, I've always felt a lot. I know I used to express that a lot through writing. My parents did encourage me to write. I'd say, um, but even when I was younger, I think the internet played a big role in in, in shaping that. Um, I think I was like thirteen or fourteen when I sent in a couple of poems that I'd written to this publication and they got published. And that was the first time I felt like I can express this in a way and it can end up Be somewhere. validated. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It was, you. it was just such an experience. And I think it gave me a lot of validation early on. And then I'd always just be writing. I, I remember my teachers would encourage me a lot. They'd just be like, and I just, I think part of it is also that golden trophy child syndrome, right? Where you're just like, you want validation. You're like, Oh, am I doing great? I want more of this. Yeah. And so, <laughs> um, not the best quality, but I think just I I responded so well to that. And so I'd write a lot more. I'd want people to read the stuff that I was writing. And I wouldn't say there were a lot of avenues where I was at that time. Um, but the Internet really opened up a whole world because you could just share your writing and get feedback on it. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and that helped a lot. And then in terms of authenticity, um, I'd say The Tempest was a big start of that. I'd always wanted to write, but I, I would say The Tempest was, this is the first startup that I was a co-founder in. And it opened up a lot of doors to just write candidly. You know, yeah. it, it really helped. Um, and my co-founder at the time really pushed me too, and the team as well. But I think what I learned was people connect when you're being real. And so the more raw the pieces were, the more we'd see people connect and share. And yeah, 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 and feel like they were a part of something. Yeah. And and that's how I felt when I read other people's writing. That's my favorite kind of writing, too, is when I really feel like I'm reading about a person. And that you can truly connect with someone. Yeah. 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 So it I think makes that's, it more personal. Yeah. yeah. And um, but why do you think it's it's difficult for people to be so candid? Like it's not common to, to see that. So why do you think it's it's like that? There's so many reasons, right? I think a lot of us want to be strong and we carry these masks or these like identities around us as we navigate the world. We don't want to be seen a certain way. We don't want stereotypes. I know I struggled a lot when I was younger with being wrong or failing. That's a big struggle I had. And for years, I even when I was candid, a lot of it was knowing that I'm trying so hard not to be a failure. Oh. And, and, and I think that that is sometimes I think what people, they can, we all carry a lot of weight with us, right? That we, sometimes it's self-inflicted, sometimes it's it's a multitude of other experiences, um, but we just don't want to be seen less than. And I think what happens is when you're really candid, sometimes there's a fear of being perceived as weak or being perceived as a certain way. And and I think that's, that's what sometimes stops people. Yeah, I think it's definitely difficult, uh, as you mentioned, to, to just be authentic because we, really view our self-worth based on what how other people see us and this is just this has emerged into such a significant part of society because of social media we're constantly um, comparing ourselves because of the environments that we're in so you you really articulated that well that it's that having that fear i guess is is instilled on us how do you think people could change that um I think I've seen waves, right? There have been times where I've seen people share a lot and then I've seen people pull back. And I think we're still finding our ground yeah. because socials are still, it's been about a couple years we've been using them, right? Um, you see TikTok where people are so unfiltered. I think it depends on what medium you're on actually. True. Because Twitter, you're gonna see people just, I think that sometimes people are just so hateful. There's also a good part of Twitter and that's the part that I love. Um, it is one of my favorite platforms, but it comes with so much. Then you see Instagram where it's a bit more aspirational. Um, and then what TikTok is just plain unfiltered. Yeah. You know, people true, are just actually. unhinged yeah. sometimes. Yeah, a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that, right? Because I think people are just being can't like it's just like, hey, you can be it's just can, me, deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that's true, actually. It depends a lot on the on the platform. Yeah. And I think I've also struggled with especially when starting this, I realized that um, I do talk 
um, what I feel or what I think. But when it comes in front of the camera, I, you know, I, I doubt myself. And especially because I, I haven't done a lot of these type of things before. Um, so this was definitely like a new challenge for me to just be myself in front of the camera. And then once you start posting, there will always be some kind of hate. But when you're receiving it for the very first time, it's just like, why am I re like, am I that bad? You know what I mean? So you yeah. start really doubting yourself. Uh, have you faced a it's, similar experience? Oh, yeah. It's been such a journey. I think even in terms of going back to putting on like a face, I actually had to unlearn. I had to unlearn writing for an audience in my journal. I would write like. Yeah. Yeah. Because you were catering to, to people. I, and I not that anyone's going to read my journal, but for some reason I would write like I was like someone was going to read, read it. it. You know, I was so afraid to just write all the ugly side of things that I was feeling. And I was I was partly like I'd, I'd hold back I wouldn't oh. really express everything even in my journal that n just you know that's my safe space and yeah and, and yet I had to really think about that and catch my every time I caught myself I was like hey like what this is my journal like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah like why am I doing this and I think it's just that years of, of yeah. um being wired to write for an audience that you sometimes can't disconnect you're always switched on and I think that that takes time to unlearn. So that was for sure. But in terms of getting lashed back in, hey, yeah, um, I would get anxiety my first couple of years. I had terrible anxiety when it came to socials because we always needed to say something. And the kind of space that we were in media wise, like we needed to be right, more importantly, in terms of our stances. And that means especially when you grow up in a different part of the world and your audience is from every part of the world, like it's just different. Yeah. You have to be so aware all the time. There's exactly. so much of research and understanding and sometimes we messed up, sometimes we didn't, but the amount of lashback that we would get, right? Because no matter which part you're catering to or you're trying to be more conscious of, there's always going to be a group of people that are going to have some form of opinions. So at one point we got death threats and we got so much hate, um, when we had a pe there were a couple of pieces actually one of them was when it was a young pakistani girl who wrote about her abortion and that got so much hate from the pakistani community and the muslim community at large and we were told uh, we and she wrote it anonymously to protect her identity but people were so mad that we were promoting immoral values and that we were just you know that that was really hard there was another instance when someone wrote about um being a survivor and and someone in their family had abused them and we got so much hate and we got threatened with legal action from the person she wrote about it was her own brother and it was one of the most I think it's one of the few moments we were really proud because we protected our identity we didn't take the piece down because she stood by it but it was hard and I think when you're just getting trolled as well we would get trolled for other other and anytime it's political justice pieces or news it just became really really it was hard online and so figuring out those boundaries and then um, navigating that. And then also I think there's always fear of being criticized, right? I know there was a time when I would sometimes post a lot. I don't post as much on Instagram, but I remember there was a time I would just post almost every day. And I remember the kind of questions I went onto a podcast and then there was a surge of people who followed me from a certain region. And I would get questions like, Oh, you, you look like you've gained weight and you look fat. It was just like very, I was like, that's so rude. And I remember once just being like, excuse me. And immediately the person was like, I'm so sorry. Like, I didn't think. And it's not even like I've got a big following at that time <laughs> or, or even now. But people were just like, oh, wait, like I didn't think you'd read, you'd read. <laughs> <laughs> read the <laughs> message. And I was just like, would you say that to uh, maybe you would. But that's just such a rude thing to say to someone you to don't anyone. know on the Internet. Yeah. Like, I feel like people just behind the screens, they just feel so comfortable being yeah. terrible. Yeah. And they have like all this negative energy bottled up throughout the day. And then they just exert that on whoever they see online. Yeah. Although I've also seen like the best of people on, on the internet. Like I, I can't tell you the amount of times people just come together through Instagram or anytime something happens and, and, you know, there's a call for anything, the way people come together, especially in times of crisis, it's, it's so beautiful, it's beautiful for sure. But what do you think of cancel culture? Because we were, we were talking a lot about hate and trolling and that relates a lot to how the cancel culture emerge. And even though I feel like it's taken to extreme lengths at times, but what is your take on that? 
It's a complex topic, right? Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about it since I watched this movie, Rocky and Rani. <laughs> oh, I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, it's, it's just, I, I loved that movie. Yeah. Um, and there's this part, right, where Rocky's just like, he's talking about cancel culture, right? He's like, I can't call anyone anything and I don't even oh, know. Yeah, yeah. Like that whole part. Um, and and that, that stuck to me because I think sometimes we expect people to be right without understanding that they have not had access to all the privilege, all the resources, knowledge learning education to have the opinions that we're privileged to have yeah and I, and and that's always stuck out to me because people are always easily like oh how can they think this way but knowing even my family in Pakistan I think there was a lot around women's rights and language and terminology and knowing and having lived you know with family seeing how people are I think people just reduced very complex issues sometimes to just right or wrong and and that's it's not, not black or white. Yeah, it's not. It's really not. Um, so I'd hope that we can have more grace for everybody. Right. It's always good to be on the right side when you're the one kind of pointing the finger versus the one who's had the finger being pointed at. Um, yeah. That's not a good place to be in. But I think at every point someone's been in that position. Yeah. And, and you can really go as extreme as you want in terms of how right you sound. But that's just not realistic in terms of the real world. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I think uh, people don't see that the way you put it was so beautifully that everyone doesn't have those resources and everyone comes from such a different environment that and it shapes them so significantly that the other person does not realize why why do you think that way but it there's a lot of factors involved in that it's not just it's not just this or that there's so much going on yeah and i remember earlier my response to to a lot of topics that were sensitive to me um, I just get so emotional. I tear up like because I didn't know how to express my anger. And when I ca- when I get really angry, I just start crying. Yeah, me um, too. And, yeah. so, and I hate it because I'm like, I don't want to cry. Yeah, same. <laughs> um, but I'm tearing up and I don't know what to do. Um, but I think over time, and this is one of those things where some of my closest friends, I have a lot of conversations with them around feminism, women's rights, and hearing them out, like I think at first, it's not just that I'd get angry, but it's just also confrontation. I, I hate confrontation. It's, it's, I will go the other way, but I've had to learn to get comfortable with it. And, and what's happened as I've gotten comfortable with it is I've started listening to what the person's saying and understanding if this is the way or the language that they speak, right? If this is the way they understand the world, you have to communicate for, for them to really understand you. You can't be talking like if you're in two different languages, essentially, and you're not understanding each other, there's no way you're going to be able to connect. Right. Exactly. And so even with issues and especially when it's a topic that you really want someone else to understand, you've got to understand how they process information and when it's factual. And then I think when you present the same argument um, using different points, it can connect and, and, and resonate better. Because I would come from a very emotional place. If these are my experiences. But if someone's understanding facts and, and being very factual, oh, or, you know, yeah. like that kind of difference. Um, and when you come at it from that perspective, I think, you yes, you have to do the work where you have to learn and you will feel like, why do I need to do all that work? Right. But I think sometimes that is how you can change. get your point across. Yeah. yeah. And maybe change someone's mind. Yeah. I'm not saying everyone needs to change anyone's mind. Now but I'm comfortable just being like, have all your opinions i have no (laughs) interest in but that's so hard to to be in that state because for me it's like if the other it's not that i discuss my opinion so that i change someone else's mind but if someone doesn't agree with me even after i've said all of these things sometimes i just get so frustrated i'm like how like how is and and i know that's wrong because i'm coming in it's sort of like i come in with the intention to just fight and argue because for the other a lot of times my friends they say that when we're talking to it's just like you want to fight with us and i'm like no that's not my intention i just want to get my point across but in the end it seems like I'm arguing. But you know, you're allowed to feel that way, right? You are allowed to feel that way. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just think over time, part of it might be, oh God, I can't believe I'm saying this. Part of it might be age. At least with me, it was getting older and getting comfortable with um, with knowing that it's okay if they don't agree. The fact that we care about each other is more important that, than yeah. the fact that they don't agree. And then I think over time, as I started speaking a different language, and when I say that, I just genuinely just mean understanding how they Dear. would resonate with them and talking to them about that and then bringing up conversations in that way that made a difference when they were willing to listen as well. Because when they they also would shut down because they felt like, 
I'm too emotional. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being emotional, but I think what's the end ob- objective, right? Are you just trying to have a conversation? Are you trying to really get the, your point across? Yeah. Um, and even my own stances with how I feel about a lot of these rates and issues and things like that is it's, you know, it's been a spectrum. And so having that change has changed a lot of me. And I don't, I don't even think I'm the person that I was a year ago in a lot of ways. And so, and that's yeah. the best thing. I think uh, I always tell people because we think of change kind of negatively, mm-hmm. negatively we say that, Oh, you've changed uh, from before, but, I feel like I don't want to be the same person I was a year ago. So I completely agree that it's beautiful when you when you compare yourself to the past and you're like, oh, I don't do these things, but I do these things. And it, uh, it, that's growth. Yeah. Yeah. Growth in so many ways. Right. It's whether you want it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you learn from all those experiences. It shapes who you are. And I feel like you're a very self-reflective person. You're very in touch with yourself and your beliefs and your values and self-reflection itself is is definitely a challenge it's not always easy to connect with your own emotions so learning to do that is also a process in itself how did you learn how to do that i did it <laughs> like <laughs> i'm still learning if i'm being honest um you you say that you used to write a lot i i wouldn't write i would just bottle everything up when i was younger and now, like the past two, three years have been a significant change in my life in the way I handle my emotions. I started journaling and I started like having more like me time. And it helped me a lot in understanding like what I think and how I feel and how do I manage this. I'm still not the best at all. Like I'm still learning. But these conversations help a yeah. lot. Yeah. I love that, though. Um, yeah, it's been a journey for me, too, I think. A lot of it was therapy helped quite a bit, I'd say, Um, because being able to really process my emotions a lot of times, I had to separate me as a person, what was happening around me, and then what other people and just, you know, a few different things and and, in my actions, all of these differently. Um, And God bless my therapist. (laughs) she, She has had such an impact because I think there were so many cycles that would repeat and I wasn't as aware of them took it took you know it took a lot of therapy to be like oh wait this feels like a repetitive cycle why am i you know kind of being attracted to to a similar dynamic in terms of work or in terms of personal and um yeah breaking out of that was it hard to start therapy um like i know there's there's views in in families and in our cultures of how therapy is so was it difficult to make the decision to start No, I don't think it was as difficult to start. I'd say there were other factors, like financially, it was just really expensive earlier on finding a good therapist or or when you connect with that's it can it can take a whole process. Right. And so um, the first couple of times I remember first I tried online and it didn't feel as good. Then I tried with one therapist and I thought this might just not work. And then um, after that, it was it, it took a few years, I think. But by that time, I sort of didn't. It's not that I hit it, but I just didn't feel like anyone's opinion was going to affect how how I was going to go for it. And I made it a priority at that time then. And and it really helped. But I yes, there was absolutely pushback in terms of you don't need therapy and and why would you go for it? And um, you're fine. You're not crazy. (laughs) Um, But but overall, I think over time, I've I've seen perceptions change of, of therapy as well with my family and that's been that's, that's been beautiful. so cool to see yeah that's awesome i think um therapy is something that even though it's evolved like people's perceptions have evolved it's still something people struggle with in terms of expressing that oh i want to start therapy because um i feel like a lot of people as you were saying have this association that if you do therapy you're crazy but it's nothing to do that it helps everyone and every anyone yeah, and I, I think in a lot of ways that uh, we were we we're trying to <laughs> uh two of my best friends and I were having a conversation and um we're talking about therapy, right? And and we were trying to really get across why it's important. And I really like this analogy, which is, you know, you could go to the gym, but having a coach will accelerate that journey, right? So you could totally do the work in terms of emotions and stuff, but oh, this that's will such accelerate a great analogy. Your, your journey. Yeah. yeah. And why wouldn't you want the support to be able to get there faster? Yeah, that's such a great analogy, actually. Yeah. It was the only one that resonated with yeah. them. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
Um, but yeah, like I think um, going back to some of the things you were talking about in terms of uh, women and how you had a lot of debates on feminism and women's rights, um, I wanted to understand your perception on how uh, on how women and men are raised in South Asian societies. Do you think that uh, there's a change that could per perhaps help with more equality? Like, what do you think about this whole landscape in... You know, so there's South Asian, but then there's South Asian in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And I think there's different okay. layers to it. There's also South Asian in more North American regions, or just the West, if you want to more broadly call it that. And I've seen such a shift in terms of how women are perceived, the respect that they have, and then what limitations they have. Because I think we are in a lot of ways, I think we're all trying to figure that out. You know, we're in a different region, and then we see it's it's that whole identity versus feeling like you're losing your identity. Exactly. And I think the further along you get, the more it, it almost feels like you have to hold on. Um, and it comes out in different ways. Um but I'd say the the one thing that I love about South Asians, at least in the Gulf, from what my experiences have been, is there is a level of respect for women here. Um, yeah. I've I've seen that shift when I've been in Pakistan, um, and that level of autonomy even, and it can change from Saudi to to here in the UAE and in different Gulf countries, it's a different culture. But I do think here there is more autonomy and there is more independence. And part of it also comes from more safety. Exactly. Right. Yeah. We, we have yeah. rights here where we know that we're going to be we can be OK. The law protects us. I think in Pakistan, it's a little bit different from what I've experienced. Um, there are more fears. And I've heard it from other South Asian countries, obviously, my friends in different parts um, of South Asia as well. Um, there are you know, there's different factors that come into play you suddenly feel like you have less options. And it's um, there are some things that are that are true, though, like marriage pressure prevalent, no matter <laughs> which part you are, unless your parents are different. But I think that that's definitely true. Um, you know, that sort of age uh, stigma that you can't get married past After a certain, a certain age, age. Yeah. Um, or that you need to get, get married within a certain age if you're if you're a girl or if you're a woman. Um, so so I think that that part is true. Um but there, of course, it's it's a little bit different in terms of the financial independence side of things. I think it, it, it even changes it based on city to city, right? I've seen a different culture in Karachi versus Lahore. And even in terms of what kind of work is acceptable and respectable. Like, it's okay to have a small business, but it's not okay for you to have an office job in, in some families. Oh, interesting. Depending on the city. Yeah. Why do you think that emerges? Like, is it based on... Yeah, why, why do you think that emerges, this differences? Um, I mean, we've had years and years of um, a certain kind of mindset as well, right? A certain kind of, I think there's a lot of things that govern it. There is government factors, right? What kind of um, a society are you growing up in? What kind of people do you have? What do you have access to, more importantly? Have you been able to get an education outside of, or have you been within those confines sometimes? And that changes because even with families, you'll see this. This, um, if you've seen a family where there's generations of, of women and men being able to get an education outside, um, and I say just outside as as sort of what I've observed, right? But I've definitely noticed the more exposure you have to outside of your surroundings, um, you obviously will have more of an open mindset versus yeah. if you don't. And yeah. I think now with the internet, it's different because of course with 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 YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and all these mm. socials, like you do have access to a lot more. Mm. And so you are more aware and there's so many more opportunities now to be able to shape your mindset. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I remember a friend of mine, um, and she comes from more of a tribal area, would tell me, what do you see in the dramas? It's not exaggerated. A lot of these stories have happened around me. And I was like, you can't be real. She's like, no, we're real. And we watch these shows because we see that hope we sometimes, can, even if they're absolutely like horrific, like just horrific shows and just horrifying stories. But she said they're real. And I remember for a minute being like, wow, like I know I've so many times dismissed these stories being like, oh, they're ridiculous. Yeah. Who's, who's watching this stuff? Always. That's what I tell my mom. Like, why do you watch this? <laughs> like, it's just a drama. It's it's not real. But but it is for some people. And I think that was so eye opening for me to be like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Wow. How do you think we could 
change those mindsets in society. Of course, these are ingrained in society for generations and generations. It's not something like a, with a click of a button, but what does it take for this to evolve? Time. Time, <laughs> Time is a big part. Um, there's a lot of different factors, I think. Where the legal system moves can sometimes actually change a lot of things as well. Um, I don't like the sort of extremist approach that we're seeing in a lot of different um, parts of the world. I think that's scary. And I think it comes to when you lack empathy and understanding, it's going to hurt you long term. It's not good for people long term. And I think when you're able to just dehumanize and be very reactive, I think people, even with faith, they've misconstrued it so much, right? Where mm. they've taken, instead of taking basic values that are so important, they have taken it and misconstrued it and, and believe a version of it or follow it and really do believe that is the only way. And I think that to me is just, that's sad. Yeah. So in terms of how to, how to change things, I think online exposure changes things. Um, I'd say more resources as well, right? When people are allowed to have more freedom to, to be and to feel comfortable doing things, that's changed a lot. And we're already seeing a lot of mindsets changed over time. For right? sure. I think pop For culture sure. plays a big, For big sure. role in this where when something's trendy and cool, of course people want to, um, get on even it subconsciously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Question even or ask questions. And I think that, but over, overall, I would hope that we can instill more curiosity, right? I think at the end of it, like that's just it. Um, because that's, that's important. And, and yeah, I think that would lead to less judgment too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, when you were talking about freedom, it, it seems like, um, the more restrictions that we place, the, the more counterintuitive uh, it is. And, the less we would be able to grow. I mean, that's kind of obvious, but this is what uh, people don't realize that um, we need to give our children or our people the freedom to to go out and talk to people, to meet new people, to be on social media because it really, really helps them. I think that even when you compare, uh, when I have conversations with some of my family members, some of my cousins, who are also based in the UAE and some of them are based in Pakistan, the conversations are so different because the mindsets are so distinct. And this is not to blame anyone. It's obviously because of the environments that we were raised in. But it's just to acknowledge the fact that this exists because of how all the resources that we have available around us and that we need to put in a little extra effort to make us make ourselves a little more knowledgeable. Yeah, and I and I also don't necessarily, I think the other part is also not to kind of misrepresent or paint a false picture, right? Because there's spectrums of all kinds of people that you'll see, all kinds of mindsets, even especially in a place like Pakistan that's so diverse. Um, even in Karachi in itself, right? You really have people from every part of the world. Um, everyone's got a, almost everyone's got a partition story or an immigrant story. Um, I don't know if immigrant's the right word, Um or Mahaja, or whatever you want to call it, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's different um, words that we've grown up with. Um, so I don't, yeah. But um, yeah, there's just a different spectrum. I think a lot of things change. Um, I know one thing that I've experienced a difference in is based on the city is the safety level. And that mm -hmm. seems to change the kind of um, experiences that, sure. that, that we were having. Because I know <clears throat> one has been very unsafe um, and then getting used to that and just knowing versus, and having things happen in the family versus in other cities where you can actually just walk out and it's okay. And yeah. I was like, damn, that's... Wow. We don't realize that is also a privilege. Such a privilege. My my khala was here um, a few months ago. We we're just walking at 10 p.m. just, you know, below our street. And she's like, it feels so nice. We can just walk. <laughs> and I don't have to worry about, like, getting robbed. And I just... I don't think I've felt as privileged in such a long time. I was like, wow, that's, I feel, I don't know. I was feeling so emotional because I was like, this is such a small thing to be able to walk out and we're just getting something. I think we're just going to uh, um, get chai from this um, cafeteria. And uh, just her saying that it just, it made me feel so emotional because I, I wish more more people and more women could uh, could experience and it's just not even women honestly the safety factor crosses genders of course women face it more um but you know i think it's just an experience everyone sort of has to sometimes deal with yeah deal with and so 
yeah, made me feel really, really privileged in that moment. Thinking, damn, such a big blessing we take for granted. Honestly, yeah. Like the more I think about it, the more I realize that safety shapes a lot of um, the way we we are taught, the way we are raised, and all of those things. And that's such a small detail, but it's such an important it's detail. One of the most important ones for me, and not just in Pakistan. I mean, even I don't think I've felt as safe as I do in this country. Nowhere else have I. And I've lived sure. in a few different parts, been to a few different places, but um, have had that privilege. But yeah, I definitely did not feel as safe as I do here. And it it's it's almost unreal how safe we can feel here. Right? Yeah. It's such a it's, blessing. It's crazy. Yeah. Like uh, when I started having friends from different countries f- for my with my university, um, they started noticing these things and they're like, oh, you know, th- we can just walk up like 4 a.m. And and that's when I started re- a lot of things I took for granted here. So many things. Yeah. That's why I'm saying the la- last three years of my life were so significant because I started realizing the things that I take for granted, which is not common the re- in the rest of the world. So it's I it's mean, the fact that people sometimes don't lock their doors, like just yeah. leave their stuff, go <laughs> come back. It's going to be here. Yeah, that's literally what I do. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to reveal that, but <laughs> uh, it's true. Like, uh, you know, you just leave your car open. Um, I don't know if that's the best <laughs> decision, but people do that. And it's because we're, we do feel safe here. Right. Yeah. And, and I and think that's a big part of that. It's part of why I've, I've, I've lived here lived for here. as long as I have. But, um, I think for a lot of time I didn't need to be here, but I just love this place so much. And I, I really do feel home at home here. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. Do you miss Saudi Arabia sometimes? Um, I mean, my parents are still there, so I do visit so every visit. now and then. Um, and of course, my great grandparents moved there. Um, they're still buried there. My grandpa as well. So we have a lot of history with Saudi as well. Um, and I've had this relationship. It's um, it's been a difficult one over time, and I've had to I've had different tangents in terms of it. Um, I think I've come to appreciate it now. I and and with the changes that are happening, no one can deny those. I think now that I've gone, I see Saudi changing so fast um i see but it's not just the physical changes i think it's the mindset changes that i'm seeing people are ready for change they are the attitudes um the the liberation in in a lot of ways i think with what um with what's happening there it's it's a very special moment in in time in history and i am more convinced every time i visit because i did you just you just feel it in the energy you feel Mm. that change and you feel that growth and, and you just um yeah, I think you, you can't help but believe in it. I love that. That's beautiful. And yeah, um, unfortunately, the time has ended. I want to continue this conversation. But that's honestly so, so beautiful. Everything that you've said, it you just... Everything you say, I just want to listen, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your time. I have a little gift for you from Karak with Mehreen. Oh, thank so you. just give me one second. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to introduce my partnership with Feel Good Tea. They're this amazing company that sells these beautiful tea boxes with a variety of tea flavors, which I'll showcase to you by opening this beautiful box. So as you can see, there's all these variety of flavors that are delicious and um, Feel Good Tea, they truly value the love for tea that we crack with Mehreen value as well. They, they love having tea. They love having conversations over tea. So because of this, I'm so excited for this partnership. And you can get this beautiful box too for you, for yourself or for your family or friends using this discount code on the screen. Okay, so oh. <laughs> this is a little gift from Karak with Mehreen. Oh, thank you so much. I, you know, I've actually just been seeing their ads. Oh, really? Oh. I'm so intrigued. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, if you want, you could open it. So it's a little partnership that I okay. would feel good tea. And um, just one second. And because they share our love for tea as well, <laughs> I felt like it was just the perfect partnership. And they have, like, all these variety of tea flavors. It's just so cute and beautiful. And you've seen the ad, so... <laughs> That's that's perfect. <laughs> I have and I've actually wanted to try it. So every Yay. time I've seen it, I've, I've I, th- I think it's still in my browser. Honestly, I should go <laughs> check, but because I, I see their ads and I, they do such a good job because the way they're showing it, it's and so I'm a sucker beautiful. for teas. So. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, 
Um, if yeah. you'd like, you can open it. And okay. Oh, this is so sweet. I love that there's like, yeah. <laughs> no, what's my name? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, are those filters? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, damn. This is, this is awesome. I wonder what flavors these are. So there's um, this page that uh, mentions all the all the flavors and um yeah i think it, it, there's a <laughs> lot of options for you to choose from. thank you it's, you it's, know i've got um at home i've actually got a tea set up and i've got a coffee set up oh so this is perfect so <laughs> yeah this is perfect because i and i have my little you know my 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 kettle um, oh that's so cute <laughs> so you really I, truly love tea and coffee yes yeah. i do <laughs> I really do. <laughs> it's the one thing I try to get whenever I visit a place as well. I try to, you know, understand if they if, if it's a thing there. Um, thank you so much. This looks amazing. Yay. And you should definitely let me know which one is your favorite. I have a feeling when it's you gonna try be, it. Oh, yeah, which one? Maybe it might be the strawberry one. Oh, strawberry one. Yeah. yeah. Or, the, or the ginger lemonade. But I, I love like fruity ones. But then I also like I'm a sucker for anything with ginger. And that's like that's a classic, you know, ginger just goes with <laughs> tea all the time. So, yeah, yeah I'm going to send you photos when I do. I yeah, actually be recently awesome. had this. Um, I got this teacup actually from um, it's from Chinatown in Singapore and they have um They've got this like little filter and it just it's like this whole set for different with different sized teacups. And you can all, sometimes have coffee in it, but it's just that's, specifically for tea. That's <laughs> so cool. You are so passionate. I love that. I love 